Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to video number 71 and audio season 3, episode 36 of Music Is Not A Genre. This is also the final episode of the season. Uh, this is the final episode for a few weeks, so I've decided to make it a big one. I'm skipping my usual introduction. If you've been listening and following along, you know what I do, and you know how grateful I am that you uh, listen and watch and read and all of that and subscribe. Uh, let's get right to the topic, and today's topic is Death is Dumb, Volume 6, Prince and the Evolution. I may change that title before uh, I go to print, but that's that's what I'm going with right now. And there's a reason why I am admitting that when there is a topic this multifaceted, it's kind of hard to come up with one sentence that summarizes everything. And I, in fact, I don't think there is a sentence or, or a title that summarizes everything. So I'm going with that right now. An alternate was Prince, My History and the Future Mystery. And that you know, applies to... But uh, let's stick with Prince and the Evolution, because, you know, if you're a Prince fan, you understand why. Now, this Death is Dumb series, again, for those of you who, uh, this is the first of the series that you're listening to, every few episodes, I discuss an artist that was or is special to me, important to me, but who died tragically, prematurely, or in some other way that is significant, that that curtailed, cut off, ended that person's career, musical output, and of course, life. And I've talked about this many times of what, you know, how to, how I uh, judge who is worth talking about. That is different for everyone. It's different for you, certainly. So there may be artists you feel more passionate about than the, uh, uh, as of now, six that I've discussed and the several more I have planned that you would prefer to talk about that hurt you when, when they left this earth. Uh, for me, these are the ones. Uh, the, and, and I don't know if there is one bigger than this week's topic, Prince. I, I've talked about uh, John Lennon, and yes, that was a pretty big one. Uh, there are several others that I've discussed and haven't discussed yet that that may you know made impacts on uh, me as a listener, me as an artist, a creator of music, and um, that that in emotionally you know in terms of life was never the same at, at once they died. But I really really don't know if I can top this one, which is why I'm ending the season with it and going out with a bang. Uh, I will talk later about what we have planned for season four, uh, you, you know, so stick around till the end. And by the way, this end, I'm not setting a time limit for this because uh, it's Prince. So there is no uh, limit that I can find to discussing Prince. And this may go the normal length of about 30-ish minutes and may go twice that long. No idea. Keep that in mind as you're listening because I'm not splitting this up into parts if for some reason it goes in any longer. And this may be completely... You know, this warning may not apply at all if I happen to wrap this up in a normal amount of time. Prince is the kind of artist that no one needs to talk about and everyone needs to talk about. And what I mean by that is it's like talking about the Beatles or, you know, Mozart. So many things have been discussed and written and, and facts and opinions and all of that already, pre-internet even, but all over the internet and all over the world, that what else can you possibly say? And at the same time, someone that's significant for many reasons and many different reasons for different people, there is always more to say. And it is important that someone like that keeps getting discussed. And, you know, as I said about the Death is Dumb series, but it, this applies to artists in general, uh, this is a different way to say it, our emotional attachments to the artists we love, be they in music or any other media, are like fingerprints. They're different for everyone. So I could stumble across uh, as rabid a Prince fan as I am. 
but their touchstones might be completely different. They may prefer different albums, different eras uh, of his career. There may be songs that resonate with them more than, than re those that resonate with me. It's, it doesn't mean that there's any kind of, you know, lack of equality there or reason to compare, really. Just that the, qu the quality of the passion is different. The quality of the emotional connection, of the artistic connection. And the reason I'm saying in this is because this is not going to be the definitive history of Prince. It's not going to be the definitive anything of Prince because I don't think that's possible. Uh, maybe 100 years from now or 50 when there's some perspective, someone might write the definitive biography and all of that. Maybe sooner. That would be great. I will read it. If they do a movie, I will watch it. But I don't think that at this point anybody can claim to have a monopoly on who Prince was, his music, and all of that stuff. So instead of trying to define uh, definitively the, the, the answer to those questions, I'm going to just go to, for one, you know, one swirl on the fingerprint of my relationship with Prince, and maybe more than one, and I'll discuss that. In other words, I'm gonna stay personal with this. Doesn't mean I won't get into some facts and things, but, but the most important thing here for me, and the reason why I do these, is my personal connection. And if other things you know happen along, such as I may go through his discography in some way or another, if those of you who are not watching what the viewers on YouTube uh, are seeing in front of them are all of my prints CDs. And yes, I have some prints on vinyl. Yes, I have some prints on cassette. Yes, I have prints streaming and stuff like that. I do not have prints on 8-track. <laughs> um, I have probably some saved MP3s of prints, whatever format. And as you know, formats don't mean jack to me because music to me is like food. I don't care if it's takeout, delivery, if I cook it, if somebody else cooks it for me, I just want it in me. And, if, and music's the same way. I don't care how it's delivered. Sure, sometimes I'd like high, a high quality meal with surround sound and you know the, everything, uh, the, the best sonic quality possible. And other times, I don't care if it sounds like a transistor radio, which is honestly what most <laughs> of what we listen to today is about as good as that. Doesn't matter. It's the, the joy of the music. And so here though, what the viewers are seeing in front of them, you listeners out there, I will describe, are more CDs on any artist than I have of any other artist, and I will ever have. Partly because I've stopped buying CDs. But partly because, and partly because his output was just so prolific, it's insane. He's one of the few artists who really never let up. Little slowdowns here, speed, speed ups there. But until his death, he was always creating and releasing new music, and I find that extremely valuable. It's, I find it generous, because there are a lot of artists out there who have contributed amazing things to this world, who either slow down considerably or stop entirely in, in, in terms of releasing new music, such as, say, Billy Joel, you know. Um, the Cure have slowed down considerably. Doesn't mean I don't respect their music, you know, uh, any any less um, or more, or whatever. Uh, it's just that I I find value in artists who are consistent in some way or another. I mean, you two are not the fastest people to release music, but they're consistent. You know, every four or five years, a new album comes out. You can always count on that. Anyway, so that's the reason why there's so many CDs here. The other thing that's unique about this is that I really stopped buying CDs about 10 years ago. I've said this before. But you may notice here on, dear God, I don't even know which side is which with these videos, but on this side, I'll pull it out for you listeners. I am holding up Hit and Run Phase 2, which was released in 2015. It was the last official release uh, before his death. And that's several years after I stopped buying CDs, but it didn't matter to me. Anything he put out, I wanted to have physically. And that's why I have so many here. And I think it might be fun 
to go through them at some point. Um, I was going to say if there's time, but there is time because I'm going to make the time. So my personal take on Prince, my personal take on Prince, we all, many of us who are Prince fans, and if you don't know this, here is a fact, that he started his career in the mid-70s and put out his first album, For You, in 1978. And was, like I said, remarkably consistent and ha had been until his death, you know, ever since then. But my personal history with Prince starts just a few years later. I was a teenager in the early 80s and a cousin of mine whose music tastes were more eclectic or eclectic in a different way than mine were at the time. I was a huge Prince fan early on before a lot of people knew about him. People knew about him because this was you know, during controversy 1999, kind of that era, but it was before he became the super ultra mega star. And she said, you should listen to this guy. And, and I said, okay, yeah, and I heard Delirious and things like that, and um, I might have even heard Little Red Corvette, and I was like, that sounds, that's great, that sounds really good. And then I was at a pool party and heard When Doves Cry. And even then, I had been creating music and writing music and listening especially. And, I, and the things I listened to were the things I listen to today, which is what is that recording doing? What's, what, what are the drums doing? The bass, the, the guitars, the voice, the lyrics. And if you know When Doves Cry, you know that during his uh, production for that, he decided, and I'll paraphrase, that the bass wasn't doing anything for the song and took it out and liked that better, it gave it the kind of qualities that he wanted. And so as I listened, I was like, where's the bass in this? Is it gonna kick in? Because you know, bass can kick in later, like so many things, and it never did. And I thought, well, that's audacious. It's ear catching and it works so well. And there was a kind of quality about the song that melded so many styles, the, the you know, funk, and electronic and rock and um, new wave, you know, on, on several more that I couldn't stop listening. And I thought to myself, okay, here's, here's someone, here's someone I need to pay more attention to. And from that point on, he and his music had a hold on me that i never, that has never, uh, you know, been relinquished. And I think it's part, in part, you know, you can, there's so many reasons, the quality of the music, uh, the, the, the depth and breadth of what he did and uh, his, the, the, his kind of outgoing stage persona and the, the way he performed them, the way he recorded them and, and uh, his movies and all of these things that you can name. But again, I'm going on the personal level and for me, it's and and you know that he took chances that he kind of opened himself up in a vulnerable way on stage and in his music that he didn't or couldn't you know in, in his private life or anytime let's say he had an interview really almost up until i think i think up until his death um when you're a teenager growing up catholic and you are taught deliberately or not shame and guilt and fear but also passion and faith and love you know and, and i'm not i'm not painting catholicism in a positive or negative way these are the qualities that that um i gleaned from catholicism as a kid and through most of my adulthood i'm sure it's still there frankly when you have that swirling around in your teen years when everything is already kind of insane then you, you kind of don't know which end is up. And, and boy, the, the results of that era and what, you know, in someone's life and what can happen to them and how they evolve are just the, the, the many, you know, there, there are as many uh, results of those as people. And no, no reason to go into all the different results except to say that mine was this combination of 
I would say, uh, internal exploration and external repression. And um, that's not a given that, that you know, the, those that everyone explores internally or that everyone, you know, represses externally. It was very, it, it's very common, but the way it happened was very particular to me. And part of it was because uh, I didn't know how to reconcile those, those two sides, let's say, of my personality, the one who did believe in kind of, you know, rules and moral responsibility and, uh, you know, the kind of things that a religion or even a moral code might teach you with the side that wanted to flat out just have sex all the time uh, or discuss it or talk about it or watch it or think about it, whatever it was and and not just sex but to have but to express passion and, and let's even say sensual passion for lots of different things let's say even music there was a period of uh, decades and I'll and and this kind of foreshadows where I'm going with this where I couldn't talk about a favorite music artist with someone who didn't like that artist. I got, I would get so incensed and I'd feel so uh, out of place and ashamed and, and angry and outraged and all of those things. Uh, not to, but at the same time, if I discovered some other person who was just a rabid fanatic of an artist and was very comfortable expressing that, I was at once jealous and dismissive. Jealous because I wish I could be that passionate externally about anything and dismissive, I would say that fanatics, you know, don't be a fanatic, whatever. And, you know, I was very negative about it and it's taken a really long time for me to shake that. And the reason it's significant here is because when I started listening to Prince and absorbing what he did from the beginning, which was to meld what I what we would call quote unquote the sacred with the profane, you know the the uh, kind of high mindedness of spirituality and religion and uh, and and love, uh, you, you know that intangible love, with uh, a grounded kind of living on the earth. You're you're a sexual animal, and there's there's lust and passion and all of that. Putting that all together, and speaking about it lyrically and, and, you know, music represented it as well in a way that said, yeah, there's a conflict, sure, there's a struggle, but it's okay. They can coexist and they can inform each other. You know, even right up until, uh, the, not even up until, but let's talk about a song from the 90s when he was well-established. Past, you know, his commercial peak in many ways, and the song Sexy MF and, you know, the, the, in a word or two, oh God, I forget the exact lyrics, but then he'd say basically about, you know, he was into this person and he said, no, uh, not just your body, no, not your body, but your mind, you fool. And he was playing with that. It was both. Yeah, I'm sure it's both, you know, but the idea that that could coexist, that love is not one or the other, it's both. Uh, or that kind of passionate love is both, was something that I desperately needed to hear. I desperately needed to hear for somebody to tell me it was okay because I didn't feel like the pieces inside of me fit. I didn't feel like I fit in the world. I didn't feel like I fit with the people I knew because they were either super duper explorers and actor outers, and, uh, and I'm, again, no judgment there, uh, drugs and sex and the whole thing, which I was afraid of at the time, or they were very uh, stringent and strict with their own behavior and with other people's behavior, but really with their own behavior, and did not indulge in anything. And I thought to myself, well, I've got some of both, you know? I like the order, I like some control, but I like to let loose, and, and I don't know how to do that. And, uh, you know, that comes a lot from this kind of Western Judeo-Christian puritanical mindset that we're, we're all still living with and, and, and the thing that's causing, one of the things causing so many problems in society and in government and all of that is still here. And anyone like Prince who's able to kind of bust through that and say, let's just let it all exist because that's actually reality. That's humanity. 
is someone who's trying to move things forward into the world, which is something he did his whole career. But for me, being that repressed, and a lot of that came internally. There was, I wouldn't say there was any one culprit or culprits, you know, it was a combination of things, but it was mostly my own brain. And, you know, I didn't know how to bust out of that in any effective way. So I would latch on serially to either people or, or ideals or ways of behavior that split them in half. Where I was a, I, I was a bit of a, I wouldn't say Jekyll and Hyde because things, you know, it never went that far. But that I would have the side of me who was very ordered and structured and, and you know, um, whatever else you want to say, moral, I guess. And then the other side of me who wanted to just go crazy. Um, not to <laughs> quote a Prince song, almost. Uh, and because... I understood intellectually that those things didn't need to be in conflict, but didn't understand emotionally. There were two things that happened. One was it took decades for me to reconcile those two sides. And two was during those decades, I needed refuges. I needed places to go that, that showed me how to, that, that those sides could be reconciled and what it would feel like, what it would sound like, what it would look like. And tell me that it was okay. And tell me that there was a way forward that if I kept kept working at this, I could make it happen too. And Prince was absolutely just 100%, 100%, as our t-shirt company, Snark Shirts by Feek says, one of those people, one of maybe the top five, who continually uh, showed me that it was okay for those two sides. Was, even when he was going through his more spiritual phase and less, you know, er erotic phase and all of that stuff, it, it didn't matter. It was him showing that life exploration was about weaving in and out of these things in whatever way makes sense to you, in whatever way uh, works for you to achieve some enlightenment of some kind, some some self-knowledge and some knowledge of the world and and hopefully more connection and compassion and all the things that I, you know, like to talk about. Um, so uh, I guess let me read a little bit from the notes I have here. As, as you know, I don't do that very often, but his juxtaposition of mystery and honesty, where he had this mysterious, even before he named himself after a symbol or, or his name was a symbol, the artist formerly known as Prince, um, which he didn't call himself, other people did, because of the symbol. They were trying to call him something. Uh, the, the statement he made about that and, you know, being beholden to the record company and wanting to own the rights and, and, and to own what he created, uh, etc. Again, look that up. You, I don't need to tell you about that. But he would con continually keep an air of mystery about himself his own personal life and kind of playing with his own sexuality and things like that but also just not talking about his personal life in much uh, much at all and uh would often take on other characters or um you know do and say things that might lead you down a road or to believe that you know he was this or that when maybe that was true and maybe it wasn't but at the same time throughout his lyrics and in the way he lived his life there was just total honesty you know, when you have somebody with a career this long who put out so much music, there is a journey there that's happening, not just on each individual album or in some cases within one song, but through the career, through that chronology, discography, through the chronography, baby. And yeah, other, other artists have done the same damn thing. And those artists might mean more to you than Prince does, but I'd, I'd say it'd be hard to find somebody who explored as much as he did, musically, lyr lyrically, uh, personally, and professionally. Uh, and, th and that's where his honesty was on every level. His melding, again, of the sacred and profane, his uncompromising vision and bravery, that at such a young age, he's like, I know what I want to do. You know, he had a father who was a musician who was not as successful, obviously, but 
showed him that music can be a career. But beyond that, he was like, but this is how I want to do it. And what's interesting to me is I have a friend who is also also loves Prince. Tremendous respect for Prince, has been influenced by Prince in his own ways and the music he does. But uh, soon after Prince died, maybe soon, within the first year, let's say, uh, said something to the effect of, Prince was awesome, but he wasn't perfect. Just look at his first couple of albums. And I think I mentioned this in another podcast even, but I think it's even more important within the context of this podcast. And that is, okay, so he didn't connect with that music early on. But when you, and, and, and let's say you listen to it now and you might be like, oh yeah, I've heard that. But the thing is, you didn't hear it then. You know, there were, there were very, very few artists doing what he was doing in 1976, 77, 78, 79, 80, you know, the, the places he went where he would do what post-disco music did, which is merge funk and, and rock and, and, and R&B and the things that disco came from that created that sound with electronic music to create, you know, new wave dance and other forms of dance that combined all of that stuff. And he did it in his own way. And not only that, played almost all of the instruments and sang, you know, all, all the vocal tracks. And so when you put it in that context, when you understand it in the context of history, music history and all of that, you understand how revolutionary it was for him to have been doing that. And that he could have settled at any point for any of the sounds he was creating on those first few albums. And while I'm talking, I'm just gonna hopefully be able to reach over here and grab this first stack for those of you who can't see, and just kind of, you know, get to a point of, well, you know, where where am I going with this? And it's really Prince For You, the eponymous Prince, which is the blue one here where he's the naked, uh, and then Prince Dirty Mind, where each step he pushed it forward a little more to the point where it got to the album's controversy and 1999 with that that merging of rock and funk and electronica was unlike anything anyone else was doing related in many ways but in in more ways unlike and it's because the ever inquisitive mind and never settling for for not evolving essentially you know I'm beginning to think my title was right, Prince and the Evolution, because it was, you know, so much of this is about evolution, whether it's Prince and, or it's music or, or me, uh, that by the end of all that, he got to a point where the, the early evolution could lead to nothing but revolution. And that's, that, of course, is what led to, you know, Purple Rain, Prince and the Revolution. And I think he knew that you know, and continued with some underrated freaking albums. It's kind of like his middle period, the way the, you know, from his early career, I equate a lot of what he did with what the Beatles did in terms of they the way they evolved so quickly. And to me, Rubber Soul Revolver, I feel like Around the World and the Day and Parade were kind of those albums for him, you know. And then, uh, and, and, he was wherever he was in his career then and people thought, oh, okay, he's doing cool stuff and had some hits, but I'm not sure where he fits in. And he does sign at the times. They're like, oh, he fits in that he is a living legend. And people knew it back then. He could, again, he could have stopped there and been a living legend. Um, but that to me is, is, it shows that early period, he already had the vision. He, and he already had the bravery to continue to, to add to his sound, to subtract when needed, to make changes, to evolve. And that's something that I think all of us need to do uh, in our lives, in our careers, in our art, whatever it is we do, 
is examine where we are and decide what things can just be the way they are because they're working and they're awesome and what things could improve, what things could be even better than they are, what things could show us more so that we could show the world more, you know. And through all of this, this uh, journey that I went through with Prince from, let's say, I, I want to say maybe 82 would have been the first time that I would have significantly started to kind of test the waters with him. Uh, through now, th there were as many ups and downs in that as there are in any person's life. And what's, you know, what's interesting to me about a relationship with an artist that you love is that if you're honest and somebody like Prince setting an example of that kind of emotional, artistic honesty and intellectual honesty, um, you hope that that example is being followed by the people who follow him in their own lives. Take a, take a page and be able to be honest, not just about the significant stuff like yourself and the people in your life and where you are and, and, and what you're doing with your life and all of that, but with that particular artist. And that is, it's not about an artist can do no wrong. An artist is, you know, or I'm criticizing an artist because this artist, you know, had a flop or did this, that, and the ad. It's not about judgment calls. It's about an artist being able to explore and go places that might resonate better with someone else than they do with you. And so it's, it's, it's been interesting to me because I still have artists like this where I am just anticipating, let's say, the new Cure album or the new U2 album or... or any others who are still putting music out like that new Matthew Sweet album, which he just put out. So there you go. And that is you wait and wait and wait, and then it comes out and you're either, and then you judge it, whether you think you do or not, whether it's that first thing in your mind or not, before you're able to fully enjoy it, you judge it. You listen to it and say, and compare it to what you've heard before. Oh, this sounds like, uh, they're trying to capture an earlier period or they are capturing an earlier period but adding something new to it or they're trying to be contemporary but too contemporary and you just start just qualifying it left and right and yeah, it takes some of the pleasure out of it but that's why things bear repeated listening because then you listen more and you find what you really feel about it and in the end, what you might feel about it is disappointment. You might be like, I waited for this and it's not what I hoped it would be. Or you might find, you know, joy and catharsis and like, ah, this is exactly what I wanted. And the thing is, it's not up to us to decide what that, well, it's up to us to decide what that is for ourselves, but not for anybody else and certainly not for the artist. Because when you have someone like, like Prince, like Bowie, like the, like the Beatles and so many others, lesser known, uh, I would argue wreck in my music even, th who don't want to, again, settle for stopping at one type of music or one period or, or what have you. You're going to have times where they'll go places where you may not follow them all the way down that road, but your overall love and respect for them and connection with them hopefully means that you are working to understand. You are working to get to a place where that new release that might have at first disappointed you, starts showing you other things. And maybe as I go through these, if I pop, I'll probably pop on one where that happened and hopefully remember what it showed me. It's, it's almost, it's impossible to remember everything, you know. And uh, that's what, I, you know, let me get to that next section then. So we, we got up to um, Sign of the Times and we know how big a smash that was at a time when people thought, well, maybe he had already had his peak. Then, you know, you get to an album like Love Sexy, which for a lot of people was a letdown, in part because he had been planning another album, which I put in order of when it was released, but honestly should have put it earlier because... Uh, it wasn't released when, when it should have been. And here's where the disaster starts happening because you can't keep all this stuff. Uh, I don't know where I put it. At any rate, 
It is the album called The Black Album, which was supposed to have been released at that time, and he switched it up, you know, released Love Sexy. Oh, here it is, yeah. And so it wasn't released until, like, not the mid-'90s, but it was this kind of, like, darker electronic and very sexual thing, and I guess he was heading in a direction where he thought, no, I want to explore something else. And the thing is... This is not one I was disappointed in when it came out. Love Sexy is one that it's got Alphabet Street, so forget it right there. That makes it worth it. But, you know, uh, Anastasia, that kind of a dark song. And, and I know the opening song is freaking awesome. Positivity is a song that could have, you know, that Parliament Funkadelic could have done, you know. And... It's as high quality, I think, as Sign of the Times or the albums that came before it, uh, even though, like, how are, you, how are you able to top something like Sign of the Times, right? I mean, I think it's a good example. And then just weird, right? He goes to Batman, where that's awesome because he took this blockbuster movie and made it his own. You know, the whole soundtrack was him. This is the soundtrack, but it's also his album. Every song on here is him and, you know, other collaborators. Uh, dang, if I can remember the woman who did Arms of Orion with him. Sheena Easton, I believe. And, uh, she, she, you know, he worked with frequently back then. It's, yeah, I thought to myself, well, this is a cool exploratory album, but maybe not his follow-up to Love Sexy. And then he puts out Graffiti Bridge. And look, love or hate the movies he's done, and of course Purple Rain is a classic, and, um, you know, the, the parade, you know, music from Under the Cherry Moon, Under the Cherry Moon, that's the name of it, or Graffiti Bridge. I take, take or leave them. That's up to you, you know. I'm not going to say they're the greatest movies in the world, but I, but I enjoy them, and I certainly enjoy the music. In fact, Parade's one of my favorite albums. Uh, you know, sometimes it snows in April, and in fact, before I even go further, screw this. Christopher Tracy's Parade, New Position, which I'm going to cover in the future. I Wonder You, Under the Cherry Moon, Girls and Boys, Life Can Be So Nice, is kind of a, one of the theme songs uh, for my partner and, and me. Um, Venus to Milo, Mountains. I already did uh, a live cover of that in one of my, po one of my live uh, YouTube Facebook shows. Do you like Kiss? Kisses on here. Another lover hole in your head. These were all big hits too, those ones. And sometimes it snows in April is the kind of sleeper that people discovered a lot when he died in April. And I always knew it was just a beautiful, beautiful song. I also covered that live. Um, but back to where we were, which is Graffiti Bridge. It was interesting to me because I thought his sound got tighter. And there were certain songs on here that just lifted me up like... Release It is probably the big one. But even uh, oh, Joy and Repetition. So talk about influence. I just released a song called The Power of Repetition and I forgot about the name of this one. Probably an influence there somewhere. Tick, Tick, Bang and Thieves in the Temple. My God, right? Um, and yeah, so, oh, Round and Round, and then Round and Round with Tevin Campbell. And that's one of those songs. This album grew on me. This was one of the ones where I was like, oh, he's going to get to whatever it was I was hoping for then. And I was initially disappointed. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, there's more here. He's going further and in a different direction. And similar to what he did with Diamonds and Pearls when he introduced, I think this is when he introduced, yes, New Power Generation, where I thought, Where's he going with this? He's, it's getting more electronic, but in this, you know, kind of way where I almost felt like he was slightly out of sync with what else was going on in the music world. But again, in hindsight, who am I to say that? This, this kind of an artist of this stature is doing what feels right. And, and people who are watching, you know, you see the hologram? Check out the cover if you can get a real version of it, of Diamonds and Pearls the way that, that it's kind of got a, a holographic cover. Um, but Diamonds and Pearls and, and Cream, Get Off, just some big, big hits. And this one grew on me too because you had songs like Money Don't Matter Tonight, one of my favorites, honestly. Thunder was freaking awesome and Daddy Pop. That I, I was like, all right, uh, this is when I started to accept that he was in a new phase, that he was doing his own thing. Here's a, 
Here's a five inch compact disc maxi single of cream. So that's interesting. And then, I mean, my God, you know, the, the symbol album, whatever you want to call it, merging male and female. And that was his, I'm, you know, screw you people phase, meaning the music and in, in the industry, you know, not the fans. And again, Prince and the New Power Generation. And this album for me was like, okay, I see where he's going now. And now I love it again. My Name is Prince was, was good. That was good. But then Sexy MF. My God. Even Love to the Nines. The Morning Papers uh, showed me, oh, yeah, you can do this the kind of like new wave rock still. The Max. It's freaking awesome. And just on and on. Seven. I mean, seven. All seven and we'll watch them fall. Just please, just go listen to seven from that album. From the unpronounceable symbol. And then uh, the hits and the B-sides, which was cool for me because, hey, at this point, I was going back and buying his older stuff. Because I didn't really start buying CDs first run for him until, uh, let's see, until Batman, I think. But no, no, I did. I have that on cassette, uh, Graffiti Bridge and cassette. I think it might have been Diamonds and Pearls when I started actually buying CDs of his, which makes sense. It was in the early 90s. But then at that point, I went back and bought all his old CDs. So even though I have some of them on cassette, some of them on vinyl, um, I eventually caught up and have his, the bulk of his major discography all on CD and went back and listened to all of his old his you know first several uh, pre pre Purple Rain because Purple Rain was the first album of his that I bought, and this Prince the hits the B sides helped expose me to some of the stuff that he was doing early on that I didn't maybe that didn't knock over my head and it and it caused me I think at that time to go back and listen to all those albums in full. And also has some stuff, like I said, B-sides and things that were maybe on singles, the actual B-sides of singles, or didn't show up on an album for some other reason. And like a very cool exploration and a summation of that whole first part of his career. Really, I think it was. Because then you have an album like Come, and there's some weird stuff on here, but Let It Go, Pheromone, this, you know, this was where I was like, he is now ditching what he he was you know had been doing since, let's say from Love Sexy on in that new exploration and deciding to go somewhere else because you know why not and like I said Black Album came out that year even though it was meant to be released several years before and then you have the Gold Experience, um, which you know Endorphin Machine and this I believe doesn't contain his last hit but I think his last huge huge hit which was the most beautiful girl in the world. And so in some ways, this was like the, you know, emeritus kind of thing where he went, he had been through that whole first part of his career and showed us that he still had the power to, to knock something out of the park. And then would come up with something like Chaos and Disorder, which was interesting to me because it was him in some ways exploring more rock type stuff but again, and yet judgment, not in the way I wanted him to. Like, who am I? Back then, there were rumors that he was going to form a power trio, and it was just going to be bass, drums, guitar, which he did, I think, perform as in smaller venues sometimes. But he never really recorded like that. And this album, some of it came close to that, but I thought, mm, ah, you know, like I just wanted to hear him let loose again and kind of... Uh, ditch some of the electronic stuff and sure why not right because it was the grunge era and that's when what was happening then so you kind of wanted uh, that kind of exploration to happen with other artists you know but again who am I right and he's at a point where he's like not only am I annoyed with the music industry and with the record companies and I'm gonna not use my name I'm gonna do what I want as far as musical output which is when he started his phase of releasing a bunch of double and triple albums. And here's this triple album here, Emancipation, right? It's him breaking out and saying, I'm, I am free, so I'm just gonna put out three albums worth of music, which was probably a drop in the bucket of the stuff that he actually had. 
And um, I think there's a cover of a song on here, I Can't Make You Love Me. Yeah, which I think was the, was it the Bonnie Raitt song. I liked the, this cover that he did. But then a, a bunch of other things. Um, there's, there was, I don't think anything that hit again as like a giant single here. This was really kind of his phase where he's like, I'm not really, this is my time people. You know, I paid my dues. I'm going to do what I want, but he's still also going to work with Spike Lee and do the soundtrack to Girl 6. I confess I've never seen that movie and I'm a huge Spike Lee fan, but I didn't care at the time. I was more interested in, in hearing Prince's music and even again, you know, some of it was um, stuff that was collated from previous releases like Erotic City, freaking amazing, Hot Thing, and Adore, and The Cross, How Come You Don't Call Me Anymore. There was the new song, Girl 6, and I forget what else was new off of this, but look it up, right? I'm not the historian. Um, fun that he could, you know, do another uh, movie soundtrack like he did with Batman and for it to be so successful and you know and then he puts out crystal ball which is i honestly forget how many geez four it's four but it's four because there's this one called the truth which was was it the was it the acoustic one kind of version it was like a little stripped down or whatever and this is one of those where quantity is quality it, like a White Album kind of thing, where there are people who constantly say the White Album would have been the Beatles' greatest album if it was shorter and they cut the fat. Oh, no, no. Cut the fat, the other albums, you know, whatever whatever you want to do, you know, or however you want to interpret that. I think every artist needs an album where they just let loose and release as much as they want and put it all on there. And yeah, Prince did that more than once, but I think Crystal Ball was kind of the definitive one in that. I mean, this whole era, certainly, but his ability to just to put all this together, but do it in a thoughtful way. It wasn't just like, I'm going to throw a bunch of things together. Like everything as with him is all well thought out. The way he would use icons and symbols, like the number two to represent the word two, when he, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and an actual I symbol to represent the word I and stuff that um, smartphones would do decades later that, you know, he helped pioneer. It's all about vision you know, and the bravery to follow that vision and do it even though no one else is. And my whole thing with Wreck and, and this past year releasing The Weird Objective, which was five albums and 32 songs, was me letting loose and saying, no, I'm not going to pay attention to the fact that you're supposed to have 10 to 12 songs that all sound similar. I'm gonna do 32 songs and there's a bunch of different styles on there and all that stuff. And you know somebody like Prince was an influence on that, like no question about it. And then you have this, which is technically not an official Prince release. It's a band he put together, which he did many times, called, uh, you know, uh, New Power Generation, New Power Soul was the name of the the um, album. And it was new. it was dedicated to New Power Generation and it's because he had a lot of people on here that he collaborated with and all of that. And I, be I believe I felt pretty satisfied with this album. Couldn't tell you, though. And then The Vault, Old Friends for Sale. So this is him pulling out stuff that he had that he's like, I'm going to release something. And, you know, they need to put out a release. And here's some stuff that, uh, uh, a little gimmies there, because it was in The Vault, like he said. Of which we know there's so many other songs and they're slowly being released which I'm very grateful for, and they're doing it in a pretty thoughtful way, I think. Um, then you have this one here, which I think, did it close out the 90s? I believe it did, or it came close to it. Rave Into the Joy Fantastic, which really kind of was a continuation of the feel of Crystal Ball, and there was a whole lot of uh, exploration on here spiritually and things like that, and, you know, a kind of high-mindedness and... Uh, I forget which one of these albums had a thing like that was basically vegan song. Uh, interesting, and I'm sure that resonates with other people. Uh, I love you, but I don't trust you anymore. Like, that's a cool song. And um, the thing is, at that point, I loved that he was putting out so much, and I loved that I didn't have to anticipate for very long that he put something else out. But it doesn't mean that I was, like, fully in love with everything he was doing, because, right... The same thing with anybody that's a part of your life, whether you know them or not. 
starting the 2000s with this exploratory album, The Rainbow Children, um, which I think had a lot of uh, instrumental stuff, was the first album that he put out back using the name Prince. So I find that this is kind of significant just for that reason. And a warm up to one of his many quote unquote comeback albums, Musicology. At a point when people were like, Prince is just gonna do his thing and you pay attention or you don't, he made everybody pay attention again. And I think this was around 2004, but please don't quote me on that. And Cinnamon Girl is one of my favorite songs of his. Um, and the musicology was a great song. And this was the album that finally prompted me after two decades at the time of fandom to go see him live. And I am so thankful that I saw him live, not just for the wonderful experience itself. And then he did like uh, Crazy Right Now, whatever that Beyonce song is. He did a cover of that live. I was like, oh my God, he's killing it as he always did live. But because had I not done that, I probably would have never seen him live. And, you know, I've got to, I've got to feel good, you know. Well, I mean, you got to feel good about that. Um, and then 30, so then you get to a place where you're like, hey, he reestablishes himself as somebody who can kick ass, you know, commercially. He's always kicked ass musically. But now he's like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do it that way as well. And he puts out 3121, which had black sweat, you know, and, and that's awesome. And I feel like this was sort of in the same vein as musicology. It was him kind of, you know, sticking to that, you know, uh, era. And then Planet Earth to me was one that uh, I sadly don't remember too well. And I would love somebody to comment below, do you have any thoughts about Planet Earth and that album? Because I think it was one that I think a lot of people didn't quite understand, they weren't sure. But to me, that was sort of like the break in between what was gonna happen next. He did his thing, he said, this is what I can do. Again, an artist who rarely waited long to put out, the longest he waited was to put out new music on record, was four years from 2010 to 2014. And I know he was doing stuff in between then anyway, um, but that's considered a short period for a lot of artists in, in many ways. He, he starts this string of albums, um, or I won't even say string, but I'll say the next couple of albums, the Lotus Flower uh, is one of them, where he was collaborating with other artists and packaging them together. So you have a triple album here, which is Prince's album, Lotus Flower, but you also have Bria, Val Bria Valente's Elixir, and then this MPL Sound, which was another, uh, you know, album of, st of his stuff, I think. Um, yeah, and that was him showing his generosity, which a lot of people, because of the mystery surrounding him, did not necessarily know about him until he died, how generous he was. But when you see the kind of empowerment he did with the people he worked with, demanding great stuff from them, but empowering them as well, and, and, and collaborating with people and trying to help them launch their careers, you have to, you know, like, don't even tell me that he wasn't a compassionate person. And 2010 was kind of this quiet album that by then, it's his own record company, MPG Records. The web, the web game was really chugging along. There were things he released on the web that I don't think I've actually heard because they were subscription only and I wasn't really doing that at the time. I was still buying CDs up to this point and I stuck with just the stuff that was released in the stores, uh, which I'm sure I'll be able to find all that other stuff at some point. But because he was doing a lot of online releasing, it felt to me like there was a break in there when there really wasn't. And so, you know, when it took him till 2014 to put out something for everyone else, I thought, well, where was he? But he was there the whole time. And then, and that's when he put out this um, Plectrum Electrum. And two things about this. He credits Prince and Third Eye Girl. So again, that's him sharing the wealth, sharing the love. But it also says on the back here, for those of you who can see, I will read it. 
produced, arranged, composed, and performed by Prince. Something that he put on, I think, every album he ever did. That's the way he put it. And I loved that from the beginning. When I first saw that, which was probably on Purple Rain, I thought, this is what I want to do. And did it. And started it. And have continued to do it. And when I put out real CDs, I would often credit myself the same way if it was the case. There were times where other people produced what I did or you know things like that. But whatever it was I did, that listing of things, it, it was inspired by the way he did it. And then he was like, all right, I'm back in the world now. I, you know, not on, just online. I'm going to put out Pectrum Electrum and then I'm going to put out Art, Artificial Age, which um, was a very, you know, you have to listen to it to understand how interesting it was. And the year before he died, puts out this double release, two separate releases, but it's, it's hit and run phase one, phase two, which... Um, can also work as a as a double album, you know, in in their own way. Um, and I love the iconography here and the graphics, the way he designed them, as always, just amazing design, but showed that he was, you know, emerging, kind of entering into another phase of his career because his graphics and his visuals, whether it was something on him or on his releases or wherever else on stage, always reflected what he was doing musically, which is not an easy thing for an artist to do. To Someone else often does that for artists, or they may have input but don't have that much control, and he always knew how he wanted to look in relation to the music he was doing at a certain time. Him him, and the, and the album covers and accompanying art and all of that stuff. It's just incredible. And at the time of, uh, you know, 2015, he was kind of approaching a period of, I would say, quiet calm in a lot of ways because he was doing these piano and a microphone concerts where he stripped everything away and it was just him, kind of the beauty and love of the music itself, just the essentials, just his voice and the, you know, um, really uh, allowing all of that to shine, um, you know, which when you're a, a great producer or love producing the way I do, you often get kind of caught in the weeds there and, and, and like to layer things and forget that letting just a song, a bare bones song, song shine through can be a wonderful thing. He was doing that concert after concert and getting to a place where he felt like, I guess, at the, up till then, he had done everything he wanted to do. So why not get back to the basics, you know, in his mid 50s? And you felt, I think I felt this kind of like white dwarf energy, white dwarf energy, uh, you know, building in him where he was getting quiet because what was coming next was going to be just as revolutionary and evolutionary as the things that he had done before. And of course, as we know, it all collapsed the day it happened. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I was somewhat estranged uh, from at the time, but still friends, contacted me and said, I, I think, dude, I think Prince just died. And I didn't believe her. So I looked it up and I found earlier reports of him getting sick and like a plane turning around and him having to cancel a concert. And I thought, oh, that must be what it was about. But as the day wore on, I realized she was right and he had died. And many, many things stopped at that point. And that was over five years ago, but it was crushing. It was absolutely crushing to the world and certainly the people who knew him and loved him, but to me personally. And again, it's the death is dumb thing. It didn't have to happen. That fentanyl shit and that, that wrong kind of medication. It took Tom Petty's life too and so many other people's lives where it was just this, you know, doctors taking advantage of, uh, of a person's trust and, and respect for them and prescribing things that didn't work and over prescribing and all of that it was a it was a dumb accident it was a stupid mistake and that's why i'm saying and for so many reasons that death is dumb and it took away whatever future music there was you know as i've always said we'll we'll never know i'm speculating as to where i thought he would go next I have no idea 
You know, his his last few years, he was on um, New Girl, the sitcom, and he, he did it, more interviews, and he was coming out more as a person to kind of be like more personable. Not that he wasn't personable for real, but that again, that kind of mystery was kind of starting to strip away. And I was looking forward to him being this kind of older, elder statesman who still didn't look one bit old. Damn him. Um, and and letting loose and being like, I can do it, say whatever I want now. You know, I've done it all and I'm just going to say all the things that people have been, you know, speculating about. Here's here's where it's, you know, going to go. Or here's where I am. But of course, it never came to be. So, you know, that's that's how it ended. And even though I've enjoyed the music that has come out since then, the things, uh, the you know, the alternate takes of things and things that weren't released before at all or things that were stripped bare, um, it's never going to be the same. That era of life is over. And uh, it sucks. There's nothing really left to say other than after a talk like that, if you if you think that I need to, to talk further about how he has influenced me, then you weren't listening. And uh, I'm just joking. But uh, listen to anything that I've ever done, and you will hear Prince in it. Uh, but I'll put a link down there to uh, uh, an album of mine called Syncope for the Weird, uh, my band Rex album, and you'll hear some, I guess, more direct Prince stuff there. But it doesn't matter. You could listen to Syzygy for the Weird. You can listen to the Sunshine Seminar or Parts and Labor. You could even listen to the Metrogan sessions or listen to you people or going even back farther. You're going to hear Prince over all that. You can listen to my unreleased demo from 1992 and you will immediately hear Prince. I'm not going to ask you any questions. You tell me what questions you have. Ask me some questions or just comment. Just tell me the things that this has brought up. Tell me what I missed. Tell me what you wish I would have talked about, because this may not be the last Prince uh, podcast that I do. We shall see. But I know it won't be the last time that I talk about him or, or muse on him or his music. I want to know, I would love to be prompted by you, uh, what you think, what you feel about any of this. Because as always, my objective here are music, conversation, and connection. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this entire season 36 podcasts uh, of the people who are listening on audio and all of the videos. And I'm, I think I'm up to over 100 podcasts now total for all three seasons. Uh, I appreciate all of that. Next season, there will be more Death is Dumb. There will be more interviews and there will be more exploring music of all kinds, things in my collection and things I'm just thinking about. I hope you have a good beginning of the summer and I will see you Oh, I don't know, in a month or so. Uh, thanks again. Talk to you soon.